Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the fifth episode of the story in which Naruto is civilian due to unforeseen circumstances, Naruto's life is derailed from his intended career. This story is from Ideas Maker, so please support him. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. Just to be clear, I am not sure if everyone's aware when Naruto tells Jiraiya about his encounters. He didn't tell it like it was written. What was written is for you readers so you can see what happened. Thus, what went on between Naruto and the Toad San Nin is less elaborated and less detailed. Just remember Naruto doesn't have much of a high opinion of Kanoha and the Toad San Nin apparently knows this. On the other hand, I am also getting a lot of reviews and questions regarding Naruto learning ninja stuff or getting his inheritance. Well, Sorry to say the answer would be a no. I want to keep him strictly a civilian. Why? I think I might be able to explain it in the epilogue. Some of the answers are also in this chapter, hopefully, they will answer all your questions. Anyway, this chapter was not easy. Both the story and the local climate were to blame. In Europe, the heat was unbearable without air conditioning. Even turning on a machine, TV, computer, generates extra heat. Still, the re-editing also took a lot of time as I try out different scenes and expressions. So anyway, here's the new chapter, I hope you like it. Jiraiya 3 After recovering from the previous chapter's shock, the Toad San Nin finally can continue. Alright, okay, I get it. Sasori, Deidara and you are friends. You share the same interests, so I get it. However, there are still many others. Unlike those two, the others will not be so forgiving. From what his spy network found out, he's not wrong to deduce Naruto being very lucky. Had Kyuubi been their target, Sasori and Deidara would have just kicked down his door and just took him. The same goes for Orochimaru, he was probably curious. At least it explains the reason why they had blindfolded him when they kidnapped him. They will be ruthless and merciless, they would care if anyone dies in the process. Especially their leader, because he will stop at nothing to get that fox in you. He probably right, but as the previous chapters indicate he's not likely to get his way. I've met their leader. They can't be reasoned with, they can't. What did you say? The San Nin had to stop what he's saying because he could swear he heard something about him meeting the leader. His eyes once again zero in on his godson. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. He said he's their leader. Now Jiraiya had to take another good look at his godson. What the hell is happening? If he could faint now, he probably would have done it. For years, he had looked and searched, and he couldn't find any information on their leader or base of operation. Here his godson, who is not even a ninja somehow not only made friends with a few members. Now he's telling him he even knows their leader. If there's a deity that's pulling his chain, he'd throttle him, her. Maybe not her if she's sexy but that's not the issue here. Did he say he knew who the Akatsuki leader is? He's been repeating himself a lot lately. Not only did he meet. Orochimaru, Sasori, and Deidara. He's now telling him he had also met the Akatsuki leader. Even he didn't know who he is, hence it's no surprise why Jiraiya couldn't believe his own ears. The kid isn't even a ninja, he's sure he's repeating himself here. Jiraiya had to stare at his godson hard. It's not that he didn't believe him but he isn't sure if his own mind can handle the stress. What? Jiraiya didn't know what to say. Having already heard his previous encounters, he supposes he will tell him another story. Despite that, he still couldn't believe his own ears. The gods are really playing some kind of game here. First thing first, he wanted to hear who this Akatsuki leader is. You say you knew who the Akatsuki leader is? He had to say it slowly and clearly so there's no misunderstanding. Yeah. He calls himself Pain, but his real name is Nagato. Nagato, that name somehow rang a bell because it sure sounds familiar. Yeah, 
Conan was with him when he showed up. Conan, now the San Nin is sure where he had heard them. It's like reality came crashing down on him as he recalls why those names were familiar to him. The gods are definitely playing a trick on me. Was it punishment for all the women I peaked? Or was it his Ika Ika series? At least that would explain why he's having a sinking feeling that his past is now finally catching up to him. This couldn't be a coincidence, could it? Akatsuki? This was all Nagato. Yeah, Nagato with purple and odd swirling eyes. I seriously should sit down for this. That last comment confirms it, Naruto wouldn't know about the Rinnegan unless he saw what it looked like. They have rumored eyes of a legend that's stronger than both the Sharingan and the Byakugan. There's probably only a handful of people on the elemental nations that knew about it, especially when they belong to the Sage of Sixth Paths. Aside from his godson, only he knew what this Rinnegan looked like. It's like he said, purple swirling eyes. The moment he said Nagato's name, he already knew it to be true but actually hearing it after all this time is still quite a shock. However, what's more, troublesome is that they were already here. With Sasori and Daidara, he can understand because they share similar interests and he probably wasn't their mission. Based on what he knows of the two, their mission is most likely prioritized on the Achibi. So why didn't Nagato take him? It was clear that his mission is the Kyubi, so why is Naruto still here? Was the Kyubi taken? That wouldn't be very likely, Uzumaki or not the kid wouldn't survive if the beast was extracted. You are going to tell me about them? If it will get rid of you, sure. Not that again. Let's hear it anyway. Henceforth another story from our hero. However, in his mind, he asked himself. When is he gonna leave? Hashtag 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 pain since the sound invasion on the leaf, Itachi and Kisame were sent to Konoha for. The purpose of finding the whereabouts of Kyubi Jinchuriki. Their mission was, if possible, abduct him. However, that wasn't their main priority because they weren't expected to succeed. That's because for some unknown reason the Kyubi Jinchuriki had somehow vanished off the face of the elemental country. They know because Zetsu couldn't find any traces of its foul chakra. So that brings the following question, was the Jinchuriki dead? Or was the Kyubi sealed away? Hence, the main purpose of Itachi and Kisame's visit was to confirm its whereabouts. Jinchurikis were ninja's village's strength simply because of its power. So it wouldn't just disappear. Even if its container is killed it would simply reform in a few years. They knew this as a fact because of the Sanbai, Three Tails, as it reform in Kiri. This is especially true with Danzo as the War Hawk Elder would not sit idle if anything threatens Kanoha's power. Hence, the only likely scenario is for it, Biju, to be sealed or hidden away. Since the two returned empty-handed, Payne thought it's time for a personal touch. At the time, they weren't very concerned because they expect the Jinchuriki to show up eventually. But over time with no news, they start to get suspicious. They had to take drastic measures because it's the only way to get a ninja village to reveal their hand. Since everything leads back to the ninja village, that's where they will start. The Jinchuriki was last heard in Kanoha, hence they had no reason to believe otherwise. At least when Itachi left, he was still in the village. Also by Madara's, Abito, account, they knew Kyubi was sealed inside an infant. They may or may not know whom the parents are with the Sandame in place as Hokage, the Jinchuriki would be well guarded. Again this fact was again confirmed by the Uchiha clan killer. Considering whom Danzo is, they had no reason to believe he's anywhere else other than inside Kanoha. However, what they hadn't factored in are the civilians. Unfortunately, that's one misconception looked down by everyone. Under normal circumstances, a civilian wouldn't be a match compared to a ninja. But this is not a confrontation, and Noon said anything about a fight. They surprised experienced veterans like the Sandame and Danzo, hence it's no surprise the Akatsuki couldn't anticipate it. 
Itachi wouldn't know about it because it was after his leave. That one single event almost triggered a riot inside the village. As everywhere you look was chaos. Combined with the Uchiha massacre event, the entire village almost declares the Kyubi being the main culprit. There were people trying to find or hunting for the demon child. There were those calling for his head outside the meeting. There were even those that went to burn his apartment. Of course, there were even those spreading the news, they all thought this is something that the whole village needs to hear. Hence, in the end, the Sandane probably did make the right call in. Sending him out of the village. Had he not, the village would have dragged him into the open and he would probably be dead before anyone can stop it. Aside from the Umbus and most of the Jonans, everyone else is against the boy. Even those that are usually neutral towards him are swayed by this one event. Even among his loyal Umbus and Jonans, there may be one or two that possess ill will towards him. Hence, the Sandame can't take that chance. Unfortunately, regardless of his intentions, Naruto was nevertheless abandoned by the village. Considering only the Umbus and Jonans that can stay impartial towards him, that's roughly 20%, maybe the most 30% of the whole population. Still, it took many years and Sasuke's testament before the true culprit is revealed. Even then, there were still many who think the demon was somehow responsible. There were even some actively trying to revise the last Uchiha view on the demon boy's involvement. However, Sasuke didn't care about Naruto. Because all he cares about is his brother, to him he's the one that took away his family, mother and father. Even as a kid, Sasuke isn't that naive to think someone like Naruto can be involved. Besides, accepting it would tarnish his clan. Regardless who Naruto is, the notion that a six-year-old kid taking down any one of his clan would be an insult. Hence, whether it's true or not, Sasuke wouldn't believe it. Thankfully, the chaotic event wasn't leaked outside the village. Since even veterans like Sandame and Danzo couldn't anticipate it, it's no surprise how the Akatsuki are equally clueless. Thanks to that one event both aged ninjas were busy keeping the village in order. Whereas Danzo makes sure no spy escape with the news. He doesn't want the QB leaving the village to be known outside and the village hence Kanoha was in heavy lockdown for months. Once the lockdown was lifted, it was already too late for Danzo as his rival watched him like a hawk. It was obvious to him that he must have suspected him for his involvement. With his past history, there's very little he can do to clear himself. Hence, the two ended up in a stalemate. Hyugas were deployed as watch 24 hours a day around the village, so even his highly trained, root agents couldn't leave the village. In the end, the war hawk had no choice but bid his time. His ninjas can still leave but it's just more difficult. This means he can't send too many out or they will be spotted. Danzo didn't know whether he should admire his rival or just hates him. The village is now so secure he doubts even a rat can get in. There are new Umbu outposts erected with several Hyugas as lookouts. As soon as something is spotted, several ninjas will immediately be deployed. Hence, sneaking in and out of the village is very risky and difficult. The War Hawk can see what his rival's trying to do. On the surface, the new formation was for village security but it has another purpose and that is to catch him in the act. It shows in meetings when they are both in the same room as the meeting often turn very awkward and tense. The Warhawk wasn't sure he should be happy or worried, but if he can get his friend to get more serious he's glad to be that sacrifice. At least the village is now looking more like a military dictatorship as it should have been. From his point of view, they are now more like Ninja Village. Even if it means he had to be a bad guy he would be happy to continue that activity. On the other hand, such drastic changes in effect have some significant impact on Akatsuki. Of course, at the time they wouldn't think much of it. With Itachi murdering his clan, it's normal for the ninja village to go on a lockdown. Since unlike Orochimaru, they don't have a mole inside the village they have no way to gather intel on their target. 
So when it comes to the time to act, they will have to do it the old-fashioned way and that's to ask them directly. Unfortunately, in ninja terms that simply means a declaration of war because you don't just show up unannounced, especially to a ninja village home without an invitation. Then again, Akatsuki is a well-known organization for a gathering group of notorious missingmans, including one of their own, Itachi. It certainly didn't help when Itachi and Kisame did wreak havoc in their village just when they were picking themselves up from the Chunin exam. It was for that reason that God came to Kanoha and it wasn't a friendly visit. Despite their barrier team alerting them in advance, the ninjas are still no match against him. Ironic enough, it was Kanoha ninja that killed his parents, it was also Kanoha's involvement that their best friend, Yahiko, is dead. That's two life-shattering events and both one way or another tied to the Leaf Village. Hence, there's a little revenge and retribution involved too. True to Akatsuki's expectation, when God came into the ninja village he was literally unstoppable. The ninjas were unprepared against someone like him. Then again, as far as they were concerned they were being invaded by multiple S-class enemies. Either way, many ninjas died that day defending their home. Although he couldn't quite get to Danzo amidst the chaos he got what he needs. Not quite the organization's target but he knew where to find him. Someone during the fight, he crosses paths with Shizun thus managed to extract the information he needs. Since she's also the Hokage assistant, what he obtained is more reliable than some no-name Chunin or high-ranking Jonin. Having found out that the target isn't in the village, Pain beat a hasty retreat. He considered raising the village but since the Jinchuriki is still out there, he chose to conserve his energy. God or not, he's not ignorant enough to waste chakra just for petty revenge. Because as far as he's concerned there could be more tough opponents ahead. When he arrived, it turns out he's overthinking the situation. He's at the right place but the bold prison is no longer a prison. It's obvious because he's just in time to see the new sign Fire Country Art Gallery being put up. Dojima happens to be there as he came to greet him and his paths. Clearly, he didn't quite recognize his organization or he would have run the other way. What is this? Nobody said anything about a gallery being here. What happened to the prison? More importantly, did his jutsu fail him? With the Yamanaka clan in the leaf, perhaps they had developed some kind of protection to shield their minds. As it turns out, it was none of the above as the ex-warden came over. Hi, I am sorry but as you can see we are not quite open. He all smiles as today marks the official opening day to the gallery. What happened to the fire prison? Eh, you don't know? We had been closed for years. All prisoners were transferred to the Shinobi prison. Despite what he said, Payne took notice of the way he said, We. I suppose you were here before this transition? Why? Yes, I was the warden. Best. The moment he said warden, the Rinnegan user instantly put him in his jutsu thus reading his mind. Since it's Dojima that came over, Noon suspected any foul play. Once he got what he needs, he left the ex-warden unconscious by a tree. I am going to say he's alive and his jutsu have the option to take his target's life or not. Since he had no animosity against him, especially a civilian, he didn't kill him. He's maybe a leader of the Akatsuki but he isn't a mass murderer. Against ninjas, he wouldn't have hesitated but against those who couldn't even fight back, he chose not to harm them. Hence, most Dojima will get is a massive headache. When he wakes up, he probably wouldn't remember the encounter so there's no risk in letting him go. From what he had gathered, the Jinchuriki is currently in fire capital and he isn't even guarded. At least there won't be any ninjas watching him, so he won't be anticipating a fight or any struggle. Also thanks to the memories, Payne knew exactly where he lives. Once there, he and his paths slip in literally without being detected. Under normal circumstances, many ninjas in one place would no doubt attract attention. This is especially true when they are all wearing that same creepy Akatsuki uniform. 
However, the trick is simple and that's not to be seen together. So by entering the capital through different entrances they avoid suspicion. Aside from that, there's another purpose why he's doing that and that's to box in the Jinchuriki. Thanks to the memories, it wasn't just the location of his house but also his favorite places and daily routines. This means while closing in on his home they can at the same time do a sweep in case he's in any of these places. It was flawless and swiftly done thus didn't raise any suspicion. Like a ghost and silently, they were already inside. And without their target knowing they lined up in front of him. However, to their surprise, it was his response that stumped them. Oh, you are already here? Even ninjas will be shocked when a group of unknowns suddenly appear in front of them, yet this civilian didn't even bat an eye. Payne also noticed how calm he is, it's almost as if he knew he's coming. Without himself knowing, he responded. You know we are coming? Yeah, kind of. It was just as he suspected, however at that moment his concern is on something else. So you know why we are here? Yeah, you want the fox! Exclamation point. Once again, his answer astonishes him. Somehow he already knew. Now Payne had to wonder if he had miscalculated something. Is this some kind of a setup? Are there ninjas in the shadows? He may not be afraid of them, but it's human nature to be extra cautious about the unknown. Also, ninja ambush is not something anyone can take lightly. Nevertheless, to his surprise, his target answered his query. There's noon but us here. And for some strange and odd reasons, he believed him. However, he still can't shake off the feeling that something's very wrong. Something that's nagging him and he had no idea why. He's God, for heaven's sake, so why isn't he in control? What's also wrong is because his opponent is just a civilian and he's calmer than God. He should be panicking, screaming, struggling futilely or even fight back, but not this teen. He had fought against Hanzo of the Salamander, against Tsunade of the Samnin and even the ninja village as a whole. However, in front of this civilian, he found himself surprisingly at a loss. I'll give you until sundown, do what you must. By the end of the day, you will be coming with me. So don't try anything funny. However, to his surprise, the blonde teen responded. I don't plan to, but I do want to paint one last portrait. It should finish by sundown. Looking at the teen oddly, he granted it anyway. So, as Naruto prepares his workstation, the paths scatter themselves around the house. Only Pain remains where he is as he watches the Jinchuriki like a hawk. Despite that, he's still curious. Who told you we were coming? Sasori and Daidara, he didn't even hesitate. Naive or not, either way, Pain could find out so it wouldn't have mattered. Sasori and Daidara probably had warned him anyway as the two had most likely left the organization and in hiding. Hashtag 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 Sasori and Daidara flashback it was true, Sasori and Daidara did come over to warn him. Since they were part of the organization, it's no surprise how they have first-hand information. Thus, the moment the order to capture him is issued they drop everything and went straight to him. Naruto isn't just their friend, he's someone they admire so it's no surprise how they value him more. They were willing to forsake and leave the organization for him. The reason they joined Akatsuki was because of art, they thought they could do what they want and eventually gain recognition. That is until Naruto points out their error thus changed their way of thinking. They knew he's right because they are now closer to their goal than they were before. Come on Naruto, come with us. With us around, Akatsuki would never find you. Nah, guys. Thanks but I am alright on my own. Besides, I will only slow you down. He's right, he's not a ninja so he will only slow them down. Besides, I don't think I can handle life constantly on the run. It's better than getting killed. Dear Darison, I appreciate the concern. But my life is all about painting. If I can't do it, 
I might as well kill myself. Despite his low self-esteem response, they both understood him very well and his love to paint. In a sense, he's kinda right. As artists themselves, they can understand his feeling very well. After all, it's what drove them to be Miss Singnans in the first place. They felt trapped and alone, over time life starts to feel dull and every day is just a repeat of another. So, yeah they knew the feeling. The other reason he couldn't just leave is mostly because of his, arts. Although Sasori offered to seal them for him that's not what he meant when he points to the arts around them. What he meant were everything, it wasn't just his paintings, it's his equipment, his home and most importantly of all the people around him. He simply couldn't just leave them, at least not yet. So they had tried, they tried to convince him for another way. But once he's decided on something, there's very little they can do to change his mind. He won't leave, what do we do, asks Daedara. He's made his choice, there's nothing we can do. I doubt the two of us can stop pain. So what do we do, the bomb maker asked again. He didn't want his friend to just be taken like that. Nothing. We retreat for now. Exclamation point. Daedara couldn't believe it. Retreat? After what he had done for us? Daedara's right, Naruto didn't just give them hope, he evolved their art. Without him, they wouldn't be where they are today. Daedara knew this and so did the puppeteer. You misunderstand. Since he won't leave and we can't stop pain. Our only sensible option is to wait for an opportunity. How? I don't know, we won't know what will happen between them. Having got to know him, they also learned how unpredictable he is. They are referring to the Orochimaru and his church painting incidents. Obviously, when they first heard it their response was pretty much like Jiraiya's. Of course, Jiraiya isn't the only one hearing about his meeting with Orochimaru. However, unlike the Toad Sanni Naruto only brought the event up through small talk. Whenever they gather, aside from the purpose of exchanging ideas they would tell him a little about the outside world. This means the missions they've been to and places they visited. As Miss Singnans, Naruto is quite curious about their adventures and places he had never been. By then, he had already learned about the Akatsuki group and how his friends are also involved. Hence, he's very much aware of their goal and why they join the organization. Hashtag 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 quick flashback, Naruto, my friend. We should warn you that there are people after you. Seeing how serious the conversation going to be, he too faced them with full attention. He had already heard the biggest secret concerning him from the fire daimyo, thus he knew what they are talking about. They are after the fox. Sasori answered truthfully but solemnly. Yes, as much as we are ashamed to admit, we are both from that very same organization. Usually, by now he should be panicking but he isn't. Thanks to the daimyo and the fire court teaching him, he's now more observant and analytical. If his two friends wanted to capture him, they would have already done so instead of talking to him. Hence, he immediately deduces there's more than what they are willing to tell him. True enough. To be honest, thanks to you we had no reason to continue with that organization, so we will be leaving. The reason we tell you this is to warn you of the danger. Just so you know, for what you did for both of us, we are eternally in your debt. Why are the two of you say it like this is goodbye? Eh? You still want us around after telling you we are from this group? I never cared for who you are in the first place. We were connected through art, there's no reason that we can't stay as friends. Besides, why do you have to leave now? The two immediately notice the quotes he uses on the words leave and now. Sasori picked up the double meaning quickly. Every organization has its own rules, whether it's the Akatsuki, Hidden Village or even the criminal world. Naruto learned this when he was among the inmates as they frequently talk about their old groups. Hence, when he said that, the puppet user immediately understood what he meant. Leaving the organization would mean they would be hunted like Orochimaru. 
So, why leave? At least, as their friend points it out, why now? Besides, the other benefit of staying would be to keep watch on the Akatsuki. Having left their old way of thinking, they were able to see clearly what the organization is. Like many fanatic groups, they all have their own end game. What would happen after Akatsuki have collected all the bijus? Payne claims it's to bring peace to the elemental nation but Sasori has a suspicion something else is also in play. So Naruto's right, they didn't need to risk themselves leaving the organization now. Hashtag 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 end of quick flashback continuing Sasori and Daidara flashback alternatively, there's always the option of kidnapping him. However, they will leave that only as last resort. Why? Some might ask. That's because as fellow artists and friends, they learned a lot about him. This, in turn, made them understand what he is. Through their interactions and feelings within his paintings, they know what kind of person he is. He may seem nonchalantly about everything but deep down he's quite fragile. It shows evidently through his paintings. Hence, for someone like Sasori he's no different from an opened book. As admirers of his paintings, it's no surprise they too can sense his feelings through them. At first, they were just curious thus tries to ask about it subtly. I heard that artist can paint messages through their work, have you seen anything like that? What, you mean like a code or something? No, but you bring up some interesting topics. What do you know about that? Again the conversation derailed. Of course, the same conversation was brought up again at another time, only this time more direct. Hey Naruto, remember we asking about painting messages? I mean feelings, you know like happiness, sadness or anger, etc. Well, I do try to make my work more enjoyable and fun to look at. Take this one for example, if you turn it upside down. You can almost see the entire conversation shifting as the two Miss Singnan stared in shock at the new painting. It's the same painting but with a different look. The funny thing is, that the same painting had been there the whole time and none of them realized there are multiple ways to view it. And to add insult to an injury, he then added. Oh, come on. I did that trick when I was nine. Poor Doja Mason, he didn't even know until someone accidentally found out. Since then he stops bragging being an expert of my paintings. Damn it, brat. Now you are bragging. Daydara couldn't help but get a little angry. Oddly enough, his partner is oddly silent. It's no surprise, Sasori pride himself on details and he missed the entire picture. Daydara too affected because he's the one that sits directly across from it. In his mind, he just realized the painting had been taunting him the whole time. The two Miss Singnans couldn't help but let loose a large sweat drop as they scan the whole room. Just how many of his paintings can do that? What's next, is he going to tell us the room is not really a room? It isn't just paintings, they had to wonder what they see is really what it is. Comically, their line of sight stopped at the window. Is that really a window? They stared and stared, thus catching their host's attention. What's wrong guys? Oh, you're right, that's a painting. Since there's no window there, so I thought I could paint it to make it look like the outside. All he got was stunned silence, again the brat tricked them. Anyway, after many unsuccessful tries, they finally gleaned that he's truly clueless in his own painting's special properties. Look, I am telling you your paintings are alive. You painted this one when you were happy. Come one, I am always happy when I pick up the brush. What about this one, this is show sadness. Of course, the painting is about the sad state of the orphanage. Again he's right, but it's also becoming abundantly clear that he's clueless to his painting's special properties. They had seen all his work and how they evolved. Since Kanahagakur, they noticed his style changed to a more free attitude. If they had to express it, it's like a soaring bird that just freed from its cage. Without his home village acting as shackle, 
he's full of the unlimited potential and his newer paintings all illustrate exactly how free and lively he is. Despite that, they can still see he's greatly missing a large family. So when he found the orphanage, the Fire Lord wasn't surprised, neither did Dojima nor his two missing mean friends. At least the orphanage can help him fill his family hole in his heart. When Sasori and Daidara offer him to leave with them, they already knew what his answer would be. His tale is all over his work, so if you know what and where to look, all the answers are there. Still, they had to ask for courtesy reasons. Despite the loom and gloom, through his work, they can see how free his spirit is. It seems he's very much aware of the danger but he didn't care. Was it ignorance or just another way of looking to the bright side? As followers of his work, although the paintings he made while in prison are amazing they are also very different from the ones he made outside. Their only conclusion was his spirit and they are both one way or another affected. It was because of that, they couldn't kidnap him. Through his paintings, they can sense how much he valued them. So they couldn't betray that trust. Missing mean or not, they didn't want to be the one responsible for killing off that free spirit. To artists like them, killing his free spirit is no different from killing Naruto himself. In addition, an artist's heart can be fragile, and this is perhaps especially true for our hero. The evidence is on his greatest masterpiece. It seems everything eventually leads them back to his wall painting. In a sense and metaphorically, Kanahagakur was his baggage. It represents his dream, his love and perhaps his duty to protect it. Unlike everyone else, he seems to understand very well what a ninja village is. However, since he was essentially evicted, abandoned and forgotten. He too left it behind in the form or essence within a painting. Unfortunately, Kanahagakur was also his backbone. Again it is metaphorically speaking because Noon can truly explain it in a scientific way. Those that follow closely with his life will understand that Kanahagakur was his true strength. It was his inner strength that let him endure pain and abuse day after day. Again those that can truly understand can sense that iron will, from Kanahagakur, at least in believing tomorrow would be a better day. It was what drove him to push forward, that one day the village will change and he will make lots of friends. So, in a sense, the ninja village was that hope. It was the dream of past Hokages, to create hope for the new generation. Unfortunately, with humanity, they have the tendency to bend the rules to suit their own agenda. As the saying goes, power corrupt, the higher-ups felt it was their duty to control that. Hope. They think that, hope, should be given to the worthy or selective few whom they approve. It's the same never-ending story with humanity, or one could say corruption as people in power believe they have the responsibility of paving a path for future generations. In a sense it's true, a government is formed to guide people to prosperity. However, there's also a fine line in how they do it because it can result in unity or division. Unity isn't easy because everyone's different as there will always be some lagging behind or against your rules. Hence, the division will rise where the rulers had to make a decision, to either find a middle ground or cut your losses and push forward to your goal. Unfortunately, some choose to push forward because to try to resolve issues would only stagnate a ninja village. We are not talking about one issue or tens of issues. This is a ninja village, so there will be literally thousands of issues. Even if you don't have enough, they will find them because people can be creative. Sadly that's where the never-ending story starts. Once a division is formed, a fight is inevitable because it would only be a matter of when. The moment it escalates and goes out of control, depending on the circumstances you will have a civil war, gangster war or even blood feud among this diversity. Naruto's situation in Konoha was an excellent example as a huge fraction went against the Hokage's wishes. Anyway, the wall painting represents what the ninja village used to be, a safe haven without all that ugliness. Upon looking, you can sometimes not recognize it because it's spiritually different. What is even more amazing is the feeling of hope coursing through the painting. 
It's like hope manifesting in a physical form. It's a miracle phenomenon because it's impossible to say what is giving out such feeling, the painting or the ninja village itself. However, to those that knew the artist personally, they sense another him. More precisely, the would-be he had he grew out what he meant to be. It's like there's a part of him on the wall. Some say it's his signature, like how an artist having a style thus leaving an imprint of himself. Others think that his Uzu paintings are alive. Although it's just a painting many truly feel they are somehow a living entity. However, Kanahagakur stands above all that and that's probably because there's another version of himself within the painting. At least that's the fire daimyo and dojima's latest conclusion. Was it his aura? His spirit? His imprint? Soul? Another life? Too bad, Noon has any experience over this phenomenon. So all they can do is speculate. In a sense, Kanahagakur is like a holy grail to a new kind of art. There's also an unmistakable presence that draws you in with open arms, like a welcoming gesture thus making it a true place of haven. Sadly, real Kanoha doesn't have such feelings. There's a theory that thinks Naruto somehow managed to strip himself of his burden and leaving it in the painting. Although ridiculous it's one plausible explanation that has merit. Some think Kanahagakur is somehow the physical manifestation of his past desire, love and duty to the village. It's past because he has no more love for that place. Those that knew him personally will understand because they can feel the changes. It's literally as if he left his feeling on the wall. Hence why some people can sense another him within the painting. Deny all you want but the feelings are unmistakable. He would have made a great Hokage had he been a ninja and the village would have prospered. Unfortunately, now they would never know. The Fire Lord had sighed many times because of that as he too had wondered what will happen to Kanoha now. Obviously, for this reason, he's keeping an eye on the ninja village. Funny enough, the Genin's nightmare catching Tora mission was his way of doing it as his wife feeds his latest news of the village. All these years, Kanoha never suspected it. They never thought that Madame Shurjimi did this on purpose and that Tora was highly trained. At least they should have known when the Tora mission continued since the Shodemera. Anyway, Kanahagakur is not something anyone ever heard of, even by ninja standards thus both Sasori and Daidara can see why it's priceless. As oddly as it may seem, by looking at the painting you can almost feel what kind of Hokage he could have been. You may not be able to see it clearly unless you know the kid. But from what they know, he would have brought peace to not only the ninja village but to the entire elemental nation. See the original manga slash anime because that would be what you will be feeling as it shows how far he would go for the leaf village. Nevertheless, what he did was godly. Hence, as his friend and fellow artist, they didn't want to change him. It would be no different to putting shackles on him. So kidnapping him would be the last thing on their mind. It may save him, but at the same time, it may destroy who he is and threaten their relationship. However, there's the other foolish and dangerous option. That's to leave him be. It's a gamble but Sasori had his reasons. And his source of confidence came from the very stories Naruto told them. So what made him so sure? Sadly, even Sasori couldn't be 100% sure. That's because when it comes to the prowess of a ninja, there isn't anyone that's on the same level as pain. Hence, when he went to Kanoha alone, none doubted him. Thus, as a civilian Naruto virtually had no chance against God. Yet still, Sasori couldn't help believing in him. Logically even he had admitted it made no sense. But having known him for years, they learned Naruto is anything but normal. There's also the event with Orochimaru, even today they still couldn't believe he had met the Sanin and came to tell about it. On top of that, Orochimaru even paid him for his service. They didn't know how much he got but based on the reaction from the royal accountant, they knew it must be no small amount. He the main capital's accountant, 
therefore it's no surprise for him to see a lot of crazy transactions. Hence, his odd reaction can only mean what Naruto nonchalantly handed over must be greater than usual. It was only thanks to Sasori's insistence that they understand this is a big deal. Hashtag 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 small flashback of that story, so I just handed it to him. Daimyo-sama said he can take care of all my transactions. That's it? asks the puppeteer. Yeah, that it, Naruto responded casually. He didn't think it would be much of a big deal. And what did the accountant do after? Sasori knew there must be more to that story. He didn't say anything. No, that didn't make sense. Naruto enjoys talking to him because he thinks every small detail is important. Well, you mentioned it. I don't know why but he had mouth wide open when he took a look at what's in the bag. By then, even Daidara seems to see what his partner's getting at. They had heard his past interactions with the accountant and he's usually very polite. Hence, when he didn't say anything made the puppet maker suspicious. Miss Singnans are suspicious by natural but Sasori is excautious. Why? 1. They are dealing with Orochimaru thus anything out of ordinary he will want to know. 2. Is that the accountant's behavior is strange so he wants to know all the details. I just assume he can handle everything, so I left. He knows where I live so he can send someone over if there's anything missing. Sighing in defeat, Sasori explains. Naruto, it's no big surprise that the royal accountant handles a lot of money transactions. However, what you probably don't know is, how much. Remember, this is the capital with the biggest economy across the nation. Hence, money transactions going into thousands, ten thousand and even a hundred thousand would be normal. In your case, a million Rio probably wouldn't shock the account too much. So I guess what Orochimaru gave you must be above that, way above that. At least that explains why he wasn't in his usual self. Usual self, questions Naruto. How does he normally greet you? Oh, yeah. He's usually exceptionally polite even when I tell him it wasn't necessary. Wow, Sasaurusan that's incredible. Is it because of the shinobi skills that you knew this? This time, it was Daidara that answered him with a deadpanned expression. Kid, even normal civilians can do this. You just needed to pay attention. It's like that almost in every visit, they would exchange stories and talk about their little adventures. Since there are still many things he didn't understand, so he's glad he has friends to talk about them. Sasori is perhaps a little dull but he's very analytical, thus Naruto enjoys listening to him explaining things. Daidara, on the other hand, is more direct, so he on well with him. Sometimes, Daidara even acted as a bridge between him and the Puppet master. However, what I still don't know is why Orochimaru giving away this much money. He said, it was my payment. Well, beggars can't be choosers. He did challenge me and he lost, so he paid up. The thing is, Orochimaru isn't someone that would just pay hence the puppet master's dilemma as he tries to figure out his reason. Then again, the kid's probably right. There's no point dwelling on something you have no control over, so Sasori left it alone. Maybe there's really no reason behind it. So how did he get Orochimaru to cough up this much money? Having Sai in defeat, he took his advice and not think about it anymore. It's one strange relationship between them as they occasionally find themselves surprising one another. Then there's also the matter concerning art. Hey, Naruto. Let me show you what I made. Didn't we agree I show him what I have first? It's first come, first serve. Besides it's already late, so it's the perfect time for my creation. Turning to their host, he said. Come on, Naruto-kun. Let's head out for a bit, I promise you this time it will be spectacular. Thankfully, fireworks aren't illegal so they can set it off in their backyard. Since the appearance of the popular Big Bang, every so often someone would fire it off for some kind of special occasion or celebration. Oddly enough, 
the new product often is first seen in fire capital before appearing anywhere else. It's another illusion why some think the maker is a fire country citizen. Nevertheless, his little demonstration will generate a sale. Some may see it, some may not but there's no doubt people will talk about it the next day. So either way, there will be a huge demand for his special brand of fireworks. In a way, the bomb maker had somehow reached his goal. People start to recognize his ideal art of a single moment, and talk about his work. The reason for their interest is because they too were connected by that moment. It was an explosion that literally blew their mind and it's also mesmerizing. For that reason, people want to see it for themselves. Additionally, the other special properties of his creation are that they can be combined. Take his latest work as an example, the The Meteorite or The Falling Star. It's clear through its names, it's basically a falling fireball. However, what is significantly more amazing is when two meteorites are used on a collision course to one another, you will end up with an even more spectacular explosion. When one was used for the first time, it had people screaming and running for their lives. Hence, when two are used simultaneously one can imagine how some think it's the end of the world. It's like watching a volcano erupting above you in very close proximate. Thankfully, by now the people are used to the Big Bang, thus knew they are harmless thus noons injured. The meteorite, although spectacular, it wasn't his greatest work. According to the majority of the community, they still think the Grand Waterfall is his best creation. It was the moment they still couldn't wipe away from their minds. More importantly, that moment was what people recognize as true art. Although not quite the goal he's trying to achieve Daydara was nevertheless happy that his creations are finally recognized. Even his usually disagreeable partner, Sasori, couldn't help but acknowledge his creation. Naruto too agreed that it was grand because it looked not only stunning, it was like watching a massive waterfall in slow motion in the sky. When it was first fired in fire capital, the whole city had watched with stunned silence. The next day, the fire capital was bombarded with questions and orders. That one-time show stunned not only the local residents, it was also witnessed by nearby villages. Many had thought it was some kind of natural phenomenon. A waterfall in the night sky? Hence, the next day nearly the whole country is talking about it. That's when the new Big Bang firework was introduced and selling like hotcakes because everyone wants the grand waterfall. And the results were more satisfying, it was mesmerizing, grand and majestic. People had been using all kinds of words to describe it but it was just not possible. Even after seeing it, many still couldn't believe their own eyes. It's like watching the greatest moment in history in slow motion. On the other hand, Sasori isn't far behind as his creations too had evolved to a point where it's widely recognized. Especially his masterpiece, Valley of End. It is widely considered a masterpiece as it illustrates the epic and fierce battle between two famous ninja warriors Hashirama Senju and Madara Uchiha. The figures don't move like his other work, however, it was the landscapes that made everything come alive. Destruction everywhere and experienced ninjas could even recognize which jutsus were used based on the leftover residues. It was simply amazing that left his audiences in awe. Even veteran ninjas were left speechless by the unbelievable amount of details because it's like the real battle itself. They wonder if it was created or the actual pieces from the battle. Nevertheless, the end result was just breathtaking. It was truly the fight of two super ninjas. Over time, he had subtly changed his ninja figures to include a piece of the environment. A bird, tree, a piece of grassland, etc. Little did people know at the time that those new additions actually enhances his creation. Even the tree next to the ninja looked real thus confusing many as they thought it was some kind of bonsai, Japanese miniature tree, check Wikipedia if you don't know. Sometimes, it's even harder to see them as sculptures. For that reason, his creations are now closer to art. Ninja figures were generally categorized as toys near the beginning or as displays. Although, 
some view them as collector's items they weren't on the level where artisans and art lovers would call them art. It wasn't until the recent changes that people start to see them differently. While simple, that additional touch adds a new dimension to his creations. It adds perspective, appeal, depth and perhaps emotion to his work. For example, by including an animal like a bird. Not only does his audience appeal to the small animal, but they also view it as some kind of emotional interaction between his ninja figure to the bird. Even a small patch of greenery can go a long way to change the appeal of his figures. Take his Valley of End as an example, had he done his figures separately and without background, his creation would simply look plain. However, by putting Hashirama and Madara together, he created interaction and tension between his figures. When it's completed with the background, his creation is in a sense encapsulated into a world. It has similar principles as paintings, without a frame a painting would look a little out of place. In a sense, a frame is like a border to separate our world to the painting's world. While it's not to the scale of UZU paintings, this new artwork was enough to trigger an outcry across the nation. This was mostly due to Kanoha's council trying to lay some kind of claim on the masterpiece, saying that the creators using their Shodame's image without their permission. The case was clearly all about money, in a sense they want free money from someone's hard work. While it's true that the creator is making money based on Kanoha Ninja's fame. However, is there such thing as ownership, especially considering ninjas in the artwork are already deceased? Thankfully, this was smoothly handled and agreed unanimously by all daimyos. Most importantly of all, they didn't want to cripple these artists' creative minds by shackling them with politics. Noon wants to fill a 200-page agreement or contract just to paint or craft something. The daimyos argued that they are free information, just like a ninja's bingo book you can't seriously claim ownership of a picture. Coincidentally, this also means that people are free to copy another's art. Many did try, but the results speak how hard it is to do. That's how you can distinguish a true artist's work because the original has all the artist's personal touch or signature. Naruto's paintings were fine examples, whereas Daidara compound mixture came from his kenjutsu it's literally impossible to replicate. There were a few close calls over the Valley of End, but so far Noon could perfectly replicate all the details to match the original. There are times that doing so is an insult to the author but from another angle, it's also an honor that others are trying to imitate your work. How is it an honor? Some may ask. It is an honor because this means there are people out there recognizing and admiring your creation. When something is good enough to be noticed, others will try and imitate. It can be art, fashion, technique, dance or even a gesture, e.g. thumbs up, vitary sign etc. However, what distinguishes its value from cheap imitations is complex and difficult it is to be replicated. Take an example of drawing a large circle, it may not be anything special. However, if you can do it efficiently, flawlessly, and without any tool, it became an art. In a sense, if your work can be copied easily, it would only mean what you did is insignificant or it's just a fluke. Valley of End isn't as simple as making figures and put them on a display. That's because every piece has a purpose, they were calculated and carefully selected through Sassari's research. Even their positioning, expression and angle are significant to his overall design. It's what makes them stand out as they further enhance the set. When it comes to his design, the best way to explain it would be in movie making. A good movie isn't all about the cast and actors, they are superficial. While good actors draw and attract the crowd but without a plot, story and right supporting elements, the movie would be a failure or end up as a flop. Not only that as the depth to the story, but scene selection, background, and all other supporting elements are also just as important. Most importantly, what most people forget is the camera itself. Aside from capturing scenes, it's what the audiences see and also the only thing that produces a movie. Hence, its positioning and angling are extremely important. Another good example would in video gaming, a first-person view, view from the character's eyes, 
can give a player a more personal feel to the game. Whereas a third-person view, view from characters back, can give a player some interactive prospect to the game. There's also the fixed angle view that gives the player a wider perspective on the environment but not off screen. So if something is coming, you won't know until it comes into view. A good example would be games like Resident Evil 7, Resident Evil 4, and the old Resident Evil series, e.g., 1, 2, 3, respectively. Anyway, what Sasori did was motion capture, where he captures the moment of the epic battle perfectly at its peak. And yes, this is the same moment that his partner Daydara been waving on since the very beginning art of the single moment. Perhaps that was why even he had to acknowledge it. Between Valley of End and the Grand Waterfall, it's impossible to judge which is better as both have its own appeals. However, what's important is that the two of them can no longer deny each other's sense in art. Of course, they only realize this after Naruto points it out and explains it to them. From his perspective, it means they have improved to a point where they had to acknowledge one another. It isn't just in their own techniques, because they too now have a broader understanding on the subject. He's not wrong, they may have acknowledged his line of reasoning but actually seeing it is another thing. This is especially true when they are the ones judging each other's work. In terms of value. Sasori may have the upper hand but Daydara can mass-produce his creations thus can sell more. Once he had the right mixture and compounds, his hand can start working. Production may also take a little time since he had only one pair of hands. So aside from that, the initial research and experimentation were the trickiest and most difficult. So overall, they both came out roughly equal. Despite that, the two still couldn't compare themselves to Boy Wonder. Aside from his incomprehensible techniques and unprecedented skills, what they admire most about him is that he can paint just about anything. Once they showed him their best work, the next time they came to visit he returned the favor by presenting his version of their best creations. Take their greatest creation as for example, his version of Grand Waterfall and Valley of End, although different, he captured its essence perfectly. His version of Grand Waterfall, while obviously done on a painting, it's just as grand and majestic as the original, but with a twist. The waterfall's clearly the main theme as it occupied almost 60% of the whole painting. However, what's so fascinating about it is what's beneath it, because from what they can see there seems to be a thriving city. You know it's thriving thanks to all the lights like it's some kind of festival going on. Aside from that strange phenomenon, there are also three shadowy spectators thus making the whole painting more mysterious. Between the three friends, there's no doubt who those three are but what made the whole scene more amazing is the angle and its position. At first glance, some may see it as innocent children watching the paranormal activity. The adjacent tree overshadowing them only add a bit of mystery to the scene. Anyway, most of the attention is drawn to the waterfall and the city beneath it. It's paranormal and an impossibility, that is if you hadn't connected it to the bomb makers, the grand waterfall. That's the beauty of UZU paintings as people can't help but draw a conclusion from them, it's what made them so entrancing. Hence, once the audiences notice the three shadowy figures, the painting further transforms into a more down to -earth feel. That's the power of his paintings as they were able to capture everyone's attention only for them to realize they were missing the whole picture. The artist is like a cunning fox that leads you on a wild goose chase only for you to lose not only it but for you to get lost. Despite all that, the overall feel for the painting is fairly balanced. That in turn only makes it more beautiful. Just painting the waterfall wouldn't have that effect. Although spectacular and amazing on its own, it was the city under it that made it mysterious. The clear night sky not only enhances its overall appearance, especially the beautiful, yet clear full moon and stars. Combine them together, they only enhance it more thus making the waterfall more dazzling. On top of that, the night view only gave him. Another excuse to light up the city thus further making it more amazing. Finally, the three figures also gave the painting a touch of humanity and innocence. 
While the artwork is built around the waterfall, some of the more sensitive audiences will be curious by the three unknown figures. They couldn't disconcert them because they can somehow feel there's a connection between them and the painting. As for Sasori and Daidara, they recognize themselves immediately and knew what Naruto's doing, as the painting serves as a reminder of that occasion. To the Mad Bomber, he understands very well that it's Naruto's way to celebrate his success. While what he had accomplished was a masterpiece, however the way the young artist remodeled it is beyond genius. He was literally and practically speechless when he saw it. Stunningly, he did the same on Sasori's Valley of End. Again while not in the same way as the waterfall, he didn't include any of them. This time, the painting is all about the fight between the two legendary ninjas, Hashirama Senju and Madara Uchiha. Like the original, he captured the stunning and fierce moment perfectly. However, what surprises them is the auras exuding from the painting. Not that you can see it but the feelings are there as it makes your hair stand on ends like you are actually there on the battlefield. The feel of killing intent, the two legendary ninjas' presence and the intense pressure. The painting literally sucks you in, making you one with the battle. What's even more amazing is that it's affecting hardened and experienced super ninjas like themselves. However, that wasn't what truly blew them away. With his level of skill and experience, replicating their best work isn't such a big deal. Despite knowing that, he can still surprise them with his imagination and creativity. It's admirable, endearing, and also kind of an honor to be copied by the greatest artist recognized by the nation. Hence, the outcome is obvious but he still managed to go beyond their expectations by literally putting a new universe into another. Take the waterfall painting as an example, the main highlight, waterfall, itself can be considered as one dimension or a universe. When he introduced it over a city, it adds a new layer of mystery. It's fantasy and paranormal that can mystify his audiences. Another layer which is the night, while it's used for cosmetic purposes to enhance everything else, you can't help but admire it. Then there's the final layer where the three witnesses were watching as it gives a sense of innocence and a more down to feel to the entire story. It's like having three worlds, the waterfall, city, the night and the mystery figures. Still, to once again remind you, that wasn't what blew their minds. Long story short, it was his church masterpieces that they doubt themselves. Skills like that are to be revered because it's inhuman and they think it's something they can't reach no matter how hard they try. They knew he's leaps and bounds ahead, but those paintings only prove he's completely on another level. How can you transform a holy place to such an extent? In ancient times, they think only gods and angels could do that. Even they have to wonder if he's truly a human. Still, to do what he did, that's something even they don't think is possible. He's truly unpredictable. Funny enough, he was quite humble about it and said that he's no different to any of them. So according to him they too should be able to do something similar, just something more suited to their own style. It made sense and at the same time encouraging. But even if he's right, they think it would take them years and years before they can catch a glimpse of that level. Unfortunately, when they say years, it's not something with a definitive value because there's no telling how long and they doubt they are talking about just a few years. While sighing, they contemplated that the experience is very useful. It's something or a direction they can take their art to the next level. True enough, Daidara was wondering if he can do this with his bombs, perhaps something like opening a gateway to the heavens. Sasori on the other hand too wondered if he can scripture a holy relic or an angelic puppet or something. Sadly, whether they will succeed or fail, only time can tell. Hashtag 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 end of small flashback it's strange, and under normal circumstances, they wouldn't think Naruto would have a chance. Then again, he is anything but conventional, so some unconventional ways of thinking are required. Once you accepted that, all the ridiculousness, idiotic, absurdity and craziness would simply go away. When Sasori clears that up, 
his partner was surprisingly silent as he too was both confused but he had no way to refute it. He tries to open his mouth but nothing came out. The puppet master knew he understood it when he blinked not once but twice then with a silent open mouth and close goldfish expression. Daydara wanted to argue but he found no grounds to support his argument. Save it, I know. It's unconventional but you already know how he is. He could only nod in response, he still didn't know how it made sense and he had no idea where to start. So he kept his mouth shut. When he thought back, Orochimaru was a fine example. When he told them about that event, their reaction was pretty much like Jiraiya's. After all the stories he told them, they learned not to underestimate him. Naruto is extraordinary like that, he and his painting didn't just change them he changed the whole ninja world. When his first painting, Desert Lotus, came out, it triggered an evolution in a ninja village never seen before followed by an international hunt on him. Once they came to know him, they realized it wasn't just his paintings that are out of ordinary. The creator himself is just as abnormal. As a matter of fact, now that they think about it everything that surrounds him is just as crazy. So before they knew it, they too were wrapped up with the flow. They too were affected by the change but for the better. By the end of the day, they found themselves enjoying being followers of true art than destruction. What Naruto said was right, art is more about creation and they never felt better for their own accomplishments. So however way you see it and according to the puppet master, he thinks Naruto in some way or another has an uncanny ability to change people. Of course, there are some extreme types like the Kanoha prisoners but he categorizes them as exceptions. So the biggest question is which category does pain fall in? Perhaps it's his bias, when it comes down to it Sasori knew which side he will be placing all his bets on. Funny enough, Daidara's no exception and he had no explanation. This is essentially pitting a civilian against a god ninja. It wasn't an exaggeration, to any ninja, pain is could be considered god. Especially when they realize who the Rinnegan was originated from. The Sage of Sixth Path was rumored to be the creator of ninjutsu, Ninshu, but over time very few knew about that. Those that knew, they knew those eyes are more powerful than Sharingan and Byakugan. Hence, logically a civilian Naruto has zero chance against him. Yet, deep down in their gut, it's telling them otherwise. As odd as it may be, the knucklehead artist has his own way of doing things. It sometimes makes you wonder whether this was all his doing or just dumb luck. Then again knowing him it is probably both, they had seen his luck and heard it through many of his stories. Sometimes they had to wonder if he was joking most of the time. Being his friend is also an oddity as Miss Singnans and civilians don't usually mix. Their lifestyle is simply just too different. However, as being said Naruto had ways to connect with people. No matter who you are, you simply can't help but lend a hand. As oddly as it may seem Orochimaru was one of those he connected with. Despite their relationship, the blonde did somehow connect with the snake Sanin thus he too changes in an odd way. Sasori and Daidara did hear about Orochimaru's strange behaviors when he fought his fellow Sanins. Unfortunately, he had since made very little appearances in the ninja world. There are rumors that he has Kanoha's last Uchiha and training him. Anyway, including themselves and their personal experiences with him that's three missingnins he made connections with. Although it's not a lot, they strongly believe Pain 2 will most likely join them. At least they think it would be a 50 50 chance. Again they too had to factor in the motive because with Orochimaru, the snake Sanin was never in him. The same goes for both of them as their interest at the time was solely on, art. With pain, however, it will be very different because Naruto will be his target. So, unless he can split out Kyubi they can't see the Rinnegan user giving up. Hence, they will wait. To see what happens. Hashtag 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 end of Sasori and Daidara flashback pain did a double take at how forthcoming he is. 
He's also surprised that it's those two because they were harmless and always going on about some kind of art. Out of the entire organization, he thought they would be least likely to deflect. So what changed them? Then he realized if the team knew he's coming. Why hadn't he left? So, why are you still here? Somehow he's more interested in his reason than Sasori and Daidara's betrayal. It's something he couldn't understand. Is this all a trick to drive a wedge between us? If that were true, how would he know their names? Wait a minute, he's just a civilian. So what he said must be true, otherwise, he wouldn't know who they are. Again if Sasori and Daidara did somehow betray the organization, why is he still here? There's nowhere else to go. Besides, I said to myself a long time ago, I wouldn't run anymore. I am tired of running, if my life comes to an end today, it will be my decision. He's serious. Payne knew because he can see his determination through his eyes. He may not be a ninja but Payne found him likable. For a moment, Naruto reminds him of Yahiko. But he quickly squishes it, this is his target. It's all for the purpose of peace. At least that's what he tells himself, it was his, Conan's and most importantly the real Yahiko's dream. Naruto didn't know what he was thinking but he wasn't finished with his own speech. I was once abandoned by my own village. I guess I am still angry and could never quite forgive them. However, when I start painting I found peace. Hence, even if it's my last act, I would still want to paint one last time. Hashtag 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 Naruto's attitude, explanation, some readers might wonder and disagree with this new attitude. Why isn't he more forgiving and less fate-orientated like in the manga slash anime? One reason would be this being a Naruto civilian story, so his attitude would be more civilian thought-based and less ninja duty-based. While he's still strong-willed, he's mostly brought up by civilians. Or more precisely, prisoners and inmate civilians. Hence, in this case, it's Kirito and Ryoma, and perhaps a little Dojima. From Kirito he learned how to paint, whereas Ryoma teaches him what it means to be family. Although Doja Mason may have very little influence he's someone that replaces the Sandame. I am not saying this will apply to everyone, but it's one possibility. A person's personality can change through various circumstances, they are no different from variables to an equation. Even then, if another person goes through the same ordeal it doesn't mean they will turn out exactly the same. It is as they say, everyone's unique to themselves. In the original manga slash anime, his meeting with Haku had a huge impact on his ninja career. It's probably true because that's how it shaped his motto a person is only strong when he has someone to protect. The same can be said. With Iruka because without him he wouldn't have the drive to continue as hard as he did. Even Kakashi plays some role with his those who don't follow rules are trash and those who abandon their teammates are worse than trash speech. Unfortunately, in this story he had nothing. As a matter of fact, he was literally abandoned and forgotten. Hence, to say his spirit being crushed would be an understatement, one might say his, will of fire, burnt itself out. When he met Payne, he would be around sixteen so that means ten years of abandonment. Additionally, there's also his last message in the form of, Kanahagakur, wall painting, he's more or less done with shinobis, Kanoha shinobis. Hashtag 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 back to the story Payne didn't know what to say. His words moved him but most of all it was his civilian way of thinking that had him doubting himself. It reminded him of his own childhood, how ninjas came uninvited into his home and murdering his parents. Perhaps that's his own guilt. In order to create everlasting peace, some sacrifices are necessary. War got started because of the Bijus, so it would only make sense to use them to end it. It is exactly the saying the end justifying the means. At least, that's what he tells himself time and time again. However, having listened to Naruto's speech and observing him with his Rinnegan, he knew he meant every word. It's just bad luck. Ultimately, 
the one that should be at fault should be the Yandame and the village that abandoned him. Sadly, at this very moment, it wouldn't change anything. Since his target claims he wouldn't run, his mission is more or less half completed. What a strange day. Even for him, this is one very unusual mission. He was well prepared to destroy the ninja village to get what he wants only to find out that the ninjas had been telling the truth. Through the Hokage's aid, he uses the new information to track the Jinchuriki all the way to the old prison and eventually making it to the capital. It was as if the whole scenario wasn't bad enough, the Jinchuriki turn out to be a defenseless civilian. What was Kanoha thinking putting a biju in a civilian? The whole notion was so stupid, he had no idea where to begin. They even left the Jinchuriki unguarded. Shouldn't there be at least be one shinobi, what about those fire guardians? So when he gives him a deadline, the Jinchuriki chose to paint. Do you want tea? Pain almost face-planted. Is the team trying one-ditch effort to poison him? But he doubts it because he sounded sincere. He responded negatively anyway. No, thanks. Just do your thing. However, he couldn't help but find himself relaxing. Why? Well, civilian or not, his target is likable and very easy talk to. So without himself realizing, he starts to open a little to him. Do you want to hear why we are gathering the bujis? Since he will be here for a while he thought he could pass the time by telling him a little about himself. At least he thought he owns. Him an explanation for sending him to a death row. Naruto didn't seem to mind and he's also curious so he responded, sure. He might not care much about ninja affairs but he's more interested in the man in front of him. Although, there are six of him Naruto had a feeling there's only one person altogether. So Pain tells him about how it all started, and ironically it was all because of Leaf Ninjas. This will be the same story he tells him in the manga or anime during his attack on Leaf. However, as Pain tells his story Naruto too starts to work. For a moment he's confused thus had to stop to see what he's doing. Please continue, I can work and listen. Shrugging his shoulders, he continued. He didn't mind either way, whether he listens or not doesn't matter but he wants it out of his chest. In his mind, as long as he can deliver, peace. Anything's worth it, right? It may seem like a noble cause, a small sacrifice for the greater good. Depending on the circumstance, a lot of people might agree but that's as long as they weren't the one doing the sacrifice. The world is changing, some might call it an evolution thus wouldn't condemn the act. It's just one man, right? As the saying goes, ignorance is bliss, so long as you don't see it noon would care about the consequences. Hence, in this case, Payne didn't want to feel that way. His family was killed just because they lived in the path of two warring nations. Was Kanoha blamed? Was anyone blamed? They weren't even shinobi, so why were they killed? Seeing Naruto as a civilian reminded him of that. So in a sense, Pain wanted to ease that guilt by going easy on him or at least let him know why he's doing this. He wants him to understand what he's doing for the betterment of the world. What better way to start than his own painful past? However, unknown to even himself. What Pain didn't realize is it's his subconscious speaking. He could have simply taken him and get it over with, but instead, he's delaying the inevitable. It wouldn't have made a difference because either way, the Jinchuriki will be dead. The mind is a strange thing, some see it as a chibi angel and chibi devil sometimes battling one another over choices. However, in reality, this could be just part of your conscious and subconscious. In this case, Payne's chibi devil would be his conscious which is capturing the Kyubi. This, in turn, means, his chibi angel would be his subconscious trying to delay the inevitable. Hashtag 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 Nagato and Conan Meanwhile, on the outside, the two Akatsuki members are starting to move. What's going on Nagato? Didn't you find the Kyubi Jinchuriki? The reason she asked is that this is the third place they searched. First Kanoha, second the fire prison and nowhere the fire capital. 
Yes, we did. I am giving him until sundown before we take him. Conan did wonder why but didn't question his choice. Nagato can sense her curiosity thus answered her anyway. He's a civilian. Oh. Even she had to do a. Double take. A civilian? A Jinchuriki, a civilian? Aside from that, she understood also something else. When they were young, all they had was one another so it's no surprise how they knew each other's pasts. So she understands why he's doing this. I see. So you offer him a, last meal, kind of thing? Yeah, civilians aren't prepared for this. Especially considering what awaits him. The biju extracting process is painful, it's like being tortured and having your life slowly sucked out of you for days to no end. They knew this because they have seen it done. Then again, there had never been a Jinchuriki that's just a civilian so they are at a loss in the process. Jinchuriki had always been a ninja village's military power, so it made no sense that he isn't trained as one. Come on, let's go. It may seem strange, why would they risk exposing themselves by entering the city with their real selves? They could always wait until the extraction time limit, his paths should be able to do that. However, the real reason is Nagato wanted to meet him and see him with his own eyes. So what's so special about the Kyubi Jinchuriki? They had encountered many powerful and legendary ninjas, Hanzo of the Salamander, Manda, etc. So what made this civilian Jinchuriki stand out? Despite what people say, the first impression is everything. Perhaps it was because of that, he caught his interest. While his clones are just as real as himself but the facts are they are still clones. Hence, he wants to meet him in person, see with his own eyes and sense with his own senses. He may not want to admit it, but blonde civilian interests him. The blonde is an enigma, so when he finished his story he wants him to see his reaction with his own eyes. While they are Akatsuki, very few actually knew their existence. Unless you are a top executes or a ninja in charge of a spy network like Jiraiya, very few recognize who they are. Even in a wheelchair, the two didn't draw much attention. By timing their entrance even the palace didn't see them. Note, Naruto's place is right in front of the guard station and the entrance to the palace. Combine with Nagato's paths they arrive through the main door without any suspicion. By the time they step onto the porch, they opened the door and let them through. All done in a blink of an eye. Perfectly timed and perfectly executed, nobody saw them. From the inside, it's another story. The clones while is strategically positioned, but they were like marionettes. Hence, when one starts to move towards the door it caught our blonde artist's attention. Then to his surprise, it let in two strangers. However, one look at their cloaks he immediately knew they are all part of the same group. What caught his attention however is that they are real, real people. The clones were obvious because apart from their eyes, their movement was very wooden. They may walk like a human being but he notices they walk in exactly the same manner. This is strange because no one person is alike, thus he deduced they are all the same person. Having spent so much time with Sasori made him easily recognize what puppets are. That also surprised the puppet user as Naruto suggested he add a little personality in each of his puppets. Again, that's why they like him as every now and then he would surprise them with his incredible insights. So aside from the distinctive pattern, our resident artist finds even the talkative pain very odd. He may seem alive and talking but somehow his eyes and body language don't correspond to one another. The blonde may not realize it, but his skills in reading people made him very observant. Hence the moment Nagato walked in, Naruto immediately knew. People's behaviors are like fingerprints, they are each unique. Thus, when the clones move the blonde immediately knew something's off. There may be in different gender and sizes but through his eyes, they are all one person. He may be in a wheelchair but Naruto recognized him as his true guest. Also, the moment their eyes met, he knew he's the real pain. Like his female partner, 
they give off human feel. At least through his eyes, they are both living and breathing human beings. When he pushed himself toward and took over telling him their story, Naruto wasn't too surprised. Don't worry, you will find out who we are in the story. Seeing him nod and going back to his painting, the redhead continues the story. Also from Nagato's point of view, he knew the teen can see this as his real self. It fascinates him that a civilian can see this much from just one meeting, so he's glad that he took the trouble coming over. Unfortunately, this still changes nothing. They needed the QB and despite the Jinchuriki being a civilian, it doesn't change his mission. One way or another, the elemental nation will have peace. On the other hand, Conan too made herself comfortable as she causally went behind the Jinchuriki to make sure he's not trying anything sneaky. While Nagato's confident that he wouldn't try anything, but there's no harm in making sure, right? Well, it's just as he says he's just painting. However, something familiar caught her eye but she dismissed it because she had a more important task to do. Like scouting out the place and checking out who and what this civilian Jinchuriki is. Sometimes a person's living standards can tell you many things so that's what she will do. At least that's probably the excuse she gives herself so she has something to do. As she wanders, she came across many paintings and eventually leading to a room full of them. So, he really likes to paint. I guess he's telling the truth after all. Despite that, she still fails to recognize the significance of the UZU signed paintings and what they represent. Had she knew, she would have realized who he is and how each of these paintings could fetch her several S-rank missions payment. However, that's not what concerns her at the moment. Having seen this many paintings, she could clearly see how unfair this is to the blonde civilian. But it is as Nagato once said, in order to achieve true peace some sacrifices are inevitable. Of course, at the time he said that he meant himself. She understood that because of the power he put into the Rinnegan, his health deteriorates. Having seen the length he would go to keep their childhood packed, bringing peace, she too found herself following him and if needed all the way to the very end. When she returned, she's just in time to hear her childhood friend finish recounting their past. Just so you know, the one that's been talking to you was Yahiko. Of course, he's already dead but I reanimated him just so that he can lead the Akatsuki. Yahiko was a leader then and he will always be the leader when Akatsuki was first formed it was to bring peace to the land so we won't stop until peace is attained. Seeing Naruto acknowledging Yahiko, Nagato continued. By now I am sure, you've probably figured out who we are. I am Nagato in the story and that's Conan. Kanan too came forth to give a nod to the blonde and stand by him. Normally, she would have moved to Nagato's side but unconsciously she was drawn to his painting. Anyway, Nagato continued. Even in death, we as his friends will continue his dream. This means collecting all the bijus, only then the elemental nations will listen and stop the war. So, do you understand why we needed the Kyubi? That's when he had to pause as he noticed her tears. What is it, Conan? A little surprised by the question directing at her, she quickly realized why. Without herself knowing, her face is full of expressive tears. It only took her a moment then she understands, they weren't tears of sadness they were tears of nostalgia. Not trusting in her emotions, she waved him over. Nagato, look. Curious and concerned about the tremble in her tone, the redhead swiftly wheeled himself towards her. It's very out of character even for her. So without suspecting anything, he turns to see what she's seeing. It took a little while longer but he too sees what she saw. What's this? Even Nagato's stunned. However, it wasn't the art that shocked him. It's what's on it that took him by surprise. It's rain country, and at the end of that path, it's a small cottage with the sunlight beaming down on it. What's even more amazing is what's in the background, it was the rumored paradise. A thick forest filled with wildlife, what's making it more appealing is the waterfall. Although in real life it's not there in Naruto's painting it was obscured in the background. 
It's like a trick, two paintings joining into one. Their nostalgia home in plain sight whereas the hidden paradise under it. It felt as if you wipe away the first layer, the paradise would be revealed. Then again, once you catch a glimpse of it, it became clear as day. It was quite fascinating, it was like the mist was disappearing. However, the moment you blink or lose concentration the painting is back to normal. Both Akatsuki members are no art experts nor art enthusiasts but the theme drew them in. To them, this is like looking into old nostalgia photos, only more. It's hard to call his work a painting because this is like stepping into its realm. So how can he create something he doesn't know or never seen before? The answer is he didn't. Everything he painted came from Nagato and his stories. When something isn't clear or he can't get a picture of, he either blurs them, paints them small or just cleverly hides it in the background. Hence, what Nagato and Conan are essentially seeing are his partial creations, whereas the rest were filled by their own minds. This is the same principle when reading an article filled with spelling errors. Despite the mistakes, your mind can still filter thus understand what it's saying. Again not everybody is that into art or paintings, and neither Nagato or Conan had time for them. They are leaders of the Akatsuki, so both were extremely busy running the show and looking after the country, rain country. So how did Naruto do it? Some might call this his luck because without himself knowing he somehow managed to connect his captors to his art world. He did it through their memories. Is that? He can't believe it. But, how? It was their home, without even seeing it Naruto managed to paint it based on their description. Well, I didn't know what else to paint for my last work so I took a page from your stories. Sorry about that. No way, I barely described it. A little insulted, the blonde voiced his proof. Hey I couldn't have made it up. I have never left fire country and I didn't even know about the place until you tell me. As Nagato thought back into his story, he did describe it as a war-torn country with hardly any vegetation. He supposes the blonde could have created the rest. However, as he turns back to the painting, what's there is surprisingly accurate. Well, he can't complain too much because he can barely remember everything. Perhaps this was the nagging feeling why he had to come personally to meet him. Despite that, Naruto did capture Rain Country's essence. It was what drew him and Conan in. Over the years, although a civilian Naruto learned to enhance his art by connecting them with his audiences. Like his church painting, for example, he painted them in relation to the original. Before picking up his brush, he researched about them, asking their origins and why they were created. Only then he links them to his creativity thus producing art never seen before. Although marked with his own signature, he kept the original style. In a sense, he had surpassed the original creator by enhancing their art but that's only as a respect to the original artist. Anyway, it was through that connection that his painting has a higher meaning to the recipient. It's no secret as both Sasori and Deidara knew thus are. Using his method. When composing art, the artist should consider who his audiences are. It's a fundamental rule in nearly everything, movie making, marketing, carpentry, etc. For example, when making a car, you need first to know who it's for and for what purpose, family, single man slash woman, location slash terrain, etc. It's what made him a success. Then again, that wasn't what made Yuziyu a success. While the portrait does have more value to the main recipient, many see his art extraordinary thus came to like it. Here, in this case, Nagato and Conan belong to the former. Naruto may not have drawn it for them but they were nevertheless connected thus belonging to the recipient category. Again, you can call it his luck. However, Naruto did not end there as what truly caught their attention is the long path in the middle. It's confusing yet at the same time filled with a lot of sentimentalities. Overall, the long and exhausting path has very deep and meaningful value to both of them. Clearly, there's a connection but only on the back of their minds. They knew they know the answer but not able to understand it. 
That's the beauty in his arts because not even the recipient can understand it. Somehow Naruto has the uncanny ability to read into a person's or person's true desire and paint it in his paintings. He may be oblivious to its meaning, but not the receiver. Like Nagato and Conan, they will be drawn and what followed would be a nagging sensation they're missing the bigger picture. Although in their story, Nagato spoke of a dream, world peace. But in the portrait, that's not what Naruto had illustrated. Instead, what he added is oddly a paradise, in the background. It's something both Nagato and Conan had long forgotten. Then they realize what they desire was never about war, it was a place that they can call home and away from the war. Unfortunately, someone down that road, they were dragged into the war they despise. From then on, they ended up fighting to escalate into a revolution and eventually taking over Rain Country. World peace became their new goal and now they are actually seeking war with the ninja nation. Seeing Naruto's painting made him rational as it gave off a tranquil feeling that allows him to think. Collecting bijus to control the ninja village will only work for a time. Because sooner or later, the ninjas would fight back and another war will break out. So why are they going through all the trouble in capturing the bijus in the first place? When Nagato realized this, he immediately links the whole deal with Madara. By then, he realized he's been played. Like Sasori, he too came to the same conclusion that something is going on and it is centered around the Akatsuki. Knowing her childhood friend, Conan knew something's up. Nagato? What's wrong? Conan, something's wrong. Something's very wrong. What? What do you mean? Think back, since when do we care about the ninja nation? Why do we want to bring peace to the whole world? Wasn't it to stop the war? Once we control the bijus, we control the ninja villages. Isn't that what we wanted? Think Conan, do you seriously think that the ninja villages would stop fighting when we have all the bijus? Exclamation point. Her friends write, the ninjas wouldn't give up that easily. Surely, they may surrender but it will only be temporary. Soon or later, they will rise again. So what do we do? We will retreat, for now, we hide. Someone is controlling the Akatsuki from behind the curtains, eventually, he, she will reveal themselves. Turning to his host. Naruto, thanks to you. I think something's really wrong with Akatsuki. So today, I will not take you. It's a surprise but Naruto didn't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. Truthfully, he isn't that fond of dying. Having said that, he and everyone were about to leave but his eyes linger on the painting and Naruto immediately knew what he wanted. Smiling in response. Take it. If it would buy me my life I am happy to part ways with it. Having said that, he picked up a brush and went to work on the portrait. In doing so, he explains. It's not quite finished, give me a few minutes. Meanwhile, Conan too was watching. There's something in the back of her mind that's been trying to get out but she didn't know what. However, as she watches him work she slowly sees what he's trying to do. Tears once again slowly fall from her eyes as she cups both of her hands over her mouth. The painting was already a masterpiece on its own. What made Conan cry was the unmistakable three bodies he added on the path. Through Conan's eyes, the three childhood friends were happily chatting as they walked through the long and never-ending path back home. However, as being said, in the background is paradise. Thus, what Naruto essentially painted is not just the three of them going home, they were heading to paradise. Of course, it may or may not exist but the painting gave them hope. Once it's finished and Nagato's ready to leave, Conan suddenly realizes what that nagging feeling was. You are that, painter? It was more of a statement than a question as she realizes who he is. While Akatsuki had no business with Yuzuyu painting but they did hear how the whole elemental nation was searching the painter. You are the one that had the whole elemental nation looking for you? Even though he's just a civilian, the short amount of time they had interacted with him made them realize he's no mere normal civilian. 
That's when Conan put two and two together as she remembers all the paintings she saw in the building. Most importantly of all, they all had the Yuzu signature. A little embarrassed, they watch him scratching his head before answering. I guess so. He didn't know much about the storm he had caused, but he did read about the aftermath. So he assumes that's what she's talking about. Sighing with exhaustion, Conan only now realizes what kind of celebrity he is and whose a place they are in. She should have known, only the painter can give them such an emotional roller coaster ride. Still, that only proves his painting is truly amazing. He may not be a ninja, but his art alone is truly s class. Unfortunately, as much as they want to continue their conversation, they had to leave. Thank you. Naruto. It's all right, it's yours by right. I've got a good story from you. Both of you take care. Conan bowed a little in response, thanking him too for the precious painting. Whereas Nagato wanted to let him understand how grateful he is to him. Naruto, let it be known that we are in your debt. Without you, we would still be puppets for war. However, the blonde didn't see it that way. I didn't do anything, you figured it out on your own. Nevertheless, we owe you one. Having said that, the group left. They had already caused him enough trouble by overstaying their welcome so it's time they go. Deep down he's really grateful for Naruto reminding whom he once was. Hashtag 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 back to Jiraiya, what? They just left like that? Yeah, never seen him since. And all he took was your painting? Yeah. It's hard to believe, but then again his explanation wasn't that detailed. Well, Naruto's just a civilian, so he wouldn't know how to report any abnormalities. Funny enough, despite Nagato telling him his story, Jiraiya's name was not once brought up. However, he did say it was Kanoha Ninja that killed his parents and a Kanoha Ninja that helped and trained them. Hence, Naruto didn't learn about the Toad Sanin until now. Then again, when he retold his encounter back to him a lot of the details are missing. Unlike Nagato giving him every detail, Naruto didn't like the super pervert and he had no obligation to tell him everything. As a matter of fact, the reason they had been talking this long was so he can get rid of him. He didn't need his protection, nor Kanoha's. If he were to die, he welcomes it then going back to his home village. Jiraiya seems to understand this thus cursing himself. Damn, why did the Fire Lord forbid him from taking his godson? It should be for his own good, we need to protect him. Unfortunately, he had no other options. The team had already faced Orochimaru, the Akatsuki, Sasori and Deidara, and even their leader, Pain. Despite all that, according to him, he came out without a scratch. For the life of him, the white-haired Sanin still couldn't understand his relationship with all of them are like. However, one thing he can understand is that he isn't in any immediate danger. So by the end of the day, he came back out empty-handed. It felt like he was booted out his godson's house. Well not literally, but he's more or less felt like it. He had tried everything short of kidnapping but his godson rejected everything. Why couldn't he understand? Why is he so willing to throw away his life? Is it because of pride? I know Kanoha wronged him but isn't it better to swallow that pride to live another day? Oh man. There's also Nagato. He's the leader of Akatsuki? What the hell happened to those kids? Oh, sh asterisk t. Nagato has the Rinnegan. If he's the enemy, he will be extremely dangerous. I need to warn Tsunade. Too bad he will find out how pointless that is. So she sent her a report through his Toad Masager. Naturally it will take a while but in the end, the Toad Sanin will find out what happened to his home village. It's just so unfortunate that a lot had happened. He couldn't get the full version but the message was enough to summarize the major incidences. Akatsuki attack, Tsunade in Kama, Danzo Hokage, 
Kage Summit and Danzo Dead by Sasuke were some of the highlights. His only consolation is that Tsunade's back to resume her Hokage position thus responding to his message. Unfortunately, just from that, he can see the elemental nation swirling into chaos. Thankfully, in her message, she said she's in the progress of fixing the broken village and collaboration with other villages. This way, he can focus on his own end. That left him in a dilemma, because everything seems to be centering around his godson and now Nagato. The prophecy said his student would either bring peace to the world or destroy it. Was it referring to Nagato? Because in terms of relation Nagato is in a sense his student. The other is Minato but he's dead. So it's highly likely the former. The question is, should he pursue him? In the end, he chose to stick with his godson because he still has unfinished business with him. He reasoned that Nagato's long gone, so he should focus on what he has now. If he goes after his old student now, it would like searching for his godson all over again. So he might as well finish what he started, but first, he had to first understand why he's like that. And he knew just where he should start as he made his way again into the palace. Authors note, he still has no idea what Naruto does or made the connection between him and the Uzu paintings. Please note that in previous chapters one never said anything about Naruto telling Jiraiya everything about Orochimaru, Sasori, and Daidara. He only referenced some of the events that were presented in the story. That's just the trick in my writing style. Anyway, Jiraiya is a writer and probably an expert in brothels in every city but he knew nothing about art. He may see his doodle but never quite understand why he does it. So as far as he's concerned his godson could be the same weirdo like Sasori and Daidara. The same can be said for Orochimaru, during the exchange Naruto never did tell him how much Orochimaru paid him. Actually, as I went back to chapter 10, near the end, he didn't even say anything about getting paid. So all he got is more mysteries. Anyway, it's probably what he should have done before coming here. Finding out more about his godson. While in Kanoha, he may have read about his abuse but what happened when he's in prison he had no information. So when he remembered his meeting with the Fire Lord, something tells him he knew more than he let on. So this time, he hoped the Fire Country leader can indulge him a little longer and explain to him what he knew. Funny enough, the fire daimyo was expecting him. I take it, it didn't go so well? Clearly, it was more of a statement than a question. Yeah, but how? I think it's better that you go see for yourself. Question mark. You can almost see all the confusion on his face so the fire lord had to elaborate. Head to the old prison, there you will find your answers. Tell Doja Mason that I sent you. He will know what to do. But. He was cut off before he can say anything. Go. He knew a dismissal when he heard one, especially coming from royalty. That would usually mean he would get his answers as he says, or he got annoyed from talking to him or a bit of both. Since he didn't want their relationship to go sour, Jiraiya quickly left. Without even knowing all the answers, he at least has a destination. It's just too bad that this location is where Grumpy Dojima is and for some reason the man hates him. Great, just great. There's no use complaining to the Fire Lord and explaining the circumstance as that would make him look bad to the Fire Country leader. So while going on his way, he hoped the man isn't as grumpy as they last met. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.